So that was my song, Sometimes, and I wrote that um, to process my experience of needing to separate from a difficult family and also um, the love that I held for them. Hi, listeners. Welcome to Grief Out Loud. Remember the last time you tried to talk about grief and suddenly everyone left the room? Grief Out Loud is opening up this often avoided conversation because grief is hard enough without having to go through it alone. We bring you a mix of personal stories, tips for supporting children, teens, and yourself, and interviews with bereavement professionals. Platitude and cliche-free, we promise. Grief Out Loud is hosted by me, Jana DeCristofero, and produced by the Dougie Center for Grieving Children and Families in Portland, Oregon. Today's guest is Licity Collins. Licity is a singer-songwriter who recently released her debut album, entitled One Girl Town. And just as the album files were complete and the campaign to promote the album was ready to begin, Licity's mother died from Alzheimer's disease. And Licity then found herself at this powerful and bizarre intersection of having to grieve her mother's death while also working to promote and celebrate her debut album. Licity, thank you first for reaching out to me and also for joining us today on Grief Out Loud. Thanks so much for having me. In preparation for this conversation, you shared with me a project you called The Open Diary. Yeah, I call it The Open Diary because I I often describe my song lyrics as coming from a stolen diary. So this one is more more open and available to everyone. And the entries you sent me uh, were totally moving, extremely powerful, because you wrote them in the moment as you got the news of your mother's death and going through her funeral. And I was just so struck because so often the the things we read from people who are grieving are from a place of perspective, two, three, five, 10, 20 years later. And yours was just right there in the moment. What was it like for you to write those entries? You know, it was... Um... It was in many ways sh- shocking in some ways. I mean, th- that deep breath I just took, I guess that's the best way to dis- describe it. It just felt like, okay, take a deep breath and sit down and write. You know, I started The Open Diary because I love to write journal style, and that's part of my songwriting process. But I also, I like to think and write and process quickly with a typewriter under my fingers. And so I started this this journal um and interestingly enough, the journal, the diary, the open diary started with grieving. I started writing it the day my favorite radio station went off the air and I was sitting in my window seat just weeping. <laughs> and little did I know, you know, the kind of grief that was to come. So, and and the, what was funny to me is I started January saying like, oh, I can't believe I've written so much about loss so far in this diary. And then my, my mother died and it was almost like comical, like, okay, like here comes more death. Um, here comes the big, big, here's the big one. Yeah. I mean, cause there were actually some smaller, not smaller, but more distant, you know, to me, more degrees of separation deaths in my world in the, in the fall. And then my community went through the fire and, um, and floods. And so then all of a sudden it was like, Oh, you've got to be kidding me. I can't believe I have to write about this. So it just was, but there was the, the, the beauty of the diary and the challenge of writing an open diary, which is, is like a, a long format, intimate, experience is I'm I'm incredibly accountable. Like there's no way I couldn't write about it. So it was more a matter of figuring out how and finding the voice and what do I what tales do I include and what am I leaving out that, you know, may or may not be good writerly style, but it's part of the emotional experience. What was really interesting to me about the fact that you wrote it present time is that so often people in the moment, they feel everything so intensely. And then a month, two months, three months later, people say, I don't remember anything about the memorial service. I can't remember anything about those first few days. And now you're going to have this record to go back and maybe have already reread multiple times. I I wonder what that's like. Does it take you right back there in time? Yeah. And part of, I love that you said that because part of why I was writing and really wanted to write for myself was to have that record. There were things I just didn't want to forget. Uh, so putting it all down 
was really potent. You know, like I went back and and stayed in this really crappy hotel room and uh, because I was in, determined to be independent from my family for this trip and not stay with anyone and not not just have the freedom of movement, freedom to, you know, I needed a hotel room the day after the funeral because I knew I was just going to want to cry. And I couldn't do that in the guest room in my dad's house or my sister's house. So to sit and do- document this hotel room with like the this window that opened up to an overflowing trash can with like a pizza stains running down the window and, you know, and that there was no hot water. And it was just like beautiful. It was so perfect. And I never wanted to forget every tiny detail of that. And I knew that memory wasn't going to suffice because, um, because I would be overwhelmed. And the cool thing is, is because I put those details down, there are a couple of things that I didn't include that I could keep Um, just for myself or just for conversation or for between people. Like I have this incredibly distinct and surreal image of the man at the, at the cemetery. You know, we all, you, I don't, I thought this was very odd. We all left. Like we put mom's urn in the ground. I was the first to jump up and put some soil on top of her. That was really important to me. And, and then before she was totally buried, we drove away and I just leaned, like looked out the window of the car watching this man in his like yellow car heart overalls, like putting the soil on my mother. You know, that that memory was really powerful, but I didn't write that down because in some ways I didn't want to lose it because it was stored in the diary. Does that make sense? Yeah, it was too too much something you wanted to keep close, personal, and Yeah, and I thought that if I wrote it down, you know, I write a lot of lists all the time so that I don't have to keep things in my brain. And I was afraid if I wrote that down, I wouldn't keep it. Yeah, that if you release it by writing it, then maybe you won't have access to it in the same way. Yeah, I, I didn't want to forget it ever. You mentioned it was really important for you to be the first person to put dirt and earth onto your mom's urn. What prompted that? Well, when my mother died, you know, everybody needed something different. And, you know, one of my sisters really needed a reception. My mother was an important person in her community. So there was this need to do something for all of these people. And the only thing my body ached to do was to put that scoop of soil on her urn in the ground. That was the thing I just grabbed onto that made it feel like that was that was putting mom to rest for me. And so, yeah, when that moment came, I was like, get out of my way. Like, I feel like I just like pushed back the the pastor or whoever was going on at the gravesite. I was just like, I'm so tired of listening to you. I don't even know you. Like, get out of my way. That's my mom. And I want to be the first one. And this is the thing that I need in this moment. This is what I need. And what was cool is I don't know that that would have happened. Like when I did it, then everybody else got up and started putting flowers and soil. And I, it was like I gave them that permission. And that w- that's the kind of thing that's super important to me. I think I'm really big on, on that. On opening the door for other people to express themselves. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to be a part of my, my nature. Going back to thinking about your mom's illness, she was ill with Alzheimer's for eight years. And as you're talking about how important it is for you to commit things to memory, to write everything down, to capture every detail of that night in the hotel room after your mom's funeral, is there a connection for you between your mom losing her memory and your dedication to uh, creating memory? Oh, I love that question. I never thought about that. Interestingly enough, when mom got Alzheimer's, every visit, I took a tape recorder. So yeah, I think I wanted to to really start to document her and maybe memory in general. I mean, memory is really important to me. Most of my songs start with memory, um, a memory of a day or a memory of a feeling um, or a memory I can't get out of my head and I wish would go away. So, And as a child of someone with Alzheimer's, yeah, you, you get scared, you know, like what's going to happen to my memory? So maybe there is an instinct there. There was a line you wrote in the in the entry that really stood out to me, and I, I'm thinking it might be connected here. You write that we needed time with her, which was also time without her. Could you share a little bit more about your, your thoughts as you wrote that? So my mother um, had a combination personality disorder of borderline personality and narcissistic personality disorder. And that meant that, like, those personality disorders are really great for the general public because people with those disorders are, like, 
My mother was a hero. I mean, people loved her. She did amazing things. But those disorders are very tough on those of us close to those people. And the the disconnect is really challenging because um, nobody can understand how hard it is because they know the one person and you know the other. I guess the best way to explain that line that we needed time with her, which was time without her, is to say, like, it's very hard to heal when someone is still hurting you. And so when mom was no longer able to hurt us, we all got to have that moment or years of, I mean, I can't say all of us. I don't know what it was like for anyone else. But for me, that's when the healing process was really able to begin because the wound wasn't continually being reopened. What I find really intriguing about that in terms of grief and the grieving process is I went back to their house, my parents' house at some point. I think it was after mom had gotten moved into a home where she was being cared for. So that was about four years into her illness. And I just, I don't know, there was something about the way I was talking about her. I remember driving by her office and just having, heaving this huge sigh of relief and saying, oh my God, it's over. And my dad said, why are you talking about your mother like she's dead? And I hadn't realized I had been. And then I researched, like, what happens when your abuser dies? And I was doing everything that was kind of on the list. And I, you know, explained that to my father. So it was like I I had this time to be free of her. And the, the, the beauty of the disease was that but she was still here. She hadn't actually died yet. So by the time she died... I missed her and I loved her and I was laughing about my memories with her and crying and you know I was I was I had I had had that time to to feel better I guess. And at the beginning of your entry you write about what your mom's first reaction was to her diagnosis was it something of this is going to be a blessing or this is a gift which is crazy we were all like what are you talking about you know like you know <laughs> And what you were just sharing, I, it makes. I'm curious if there's a connection there for her. Yeah, I mean, as uh, my mother is incredibly uh, prescient, like she has this connection to the women in my family on her side have this kind of psychic thing going on, and so she she had this way of of being able to say stuff like that and. At the time, she was like, I'm going to write a book. And she was fighting it. That Alzheimer's is tough. She, you know, there's a big, at least for mom, there was a big period of denial. She wasn't, she didn't want to let the, it, it get her. She didn't want to admit she had it. She did, And then that turned into, okay, I'm going to say that this is a good thing. But when she died, it was, it just seemed like an incredibly generous act for her to be sick for so long because we did have an opportunity, whether whether my members of my family took that or not, to what extent they did and what extent it worked for each of them, I can't really say. But for me, she gave me a freedom that I desperately needed. And part of that freedom for me was that a couple years after she went into the home, I actually had to disconnect from my family because there was a lot of toxic influences there. And I could have never done that had mom been of sound mind and in my life on a regular basis. So in a sense, it's a, a gift of some emotional freedom. For yeah, you. I needed freedom. That was for sure. And mom basically said, yeah, here you go. So you go through this process of having had such a conflicted, painful relationship with your mom while she was alive, and then in, throughout her illness, having an opportunity to heal some of those ruptures. And then you fly back to Washington, D.C., and you see everybody for the funeral. What happened with that piece then? Oh, my goodness. Am I allowed to swear? <laughs> 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 I, will, I won't. But okay. So, so I remember before I went there, and I do want to say, like, my mom and I had a blast also growing up. I mean, it's such a, like, 50-50 split. You know, it's like, man, I wish you weren't torturing me because when you're not, you're a lot of fun. You know, <laughs> like, so, and, and you're a lot of fun because you're crazy. You know, so when the, I found out there was going to be this reception for all these people and my mother worked with like in a satellite program to the schools. So that meant she was always shadowing over every breath I took everywhere. You know, I was always her daughter and part of her work was being intimidating. So people were afraid of her, which meant they were afraid of me. It was just really, a, a, it was something growing up under her shadow. And uh, 
I kept saying to people, because I'm in California and and my family is all back east. And before I left, I kept saying, man, I don't want to go to that reception. Like, I don't want to see those a-holes, you know, like, I don't want to see those people, you know. And, and I hated the reception. I hated it because I had made a lot of peace with, like, the mom I knew at home, you know, and the mom who... Like I said, we had fun. Like we used to go to the mall. I was definitely like her impulse shopping buddy. So that was really fun when she was going to buy some giant piece of, you know, Victorian furniture. She got this Victorian couch she really wanted. That was so much fun. Like we got to scope that out. And I felt like I was doing something scandalous because dad was going to be mad. It was just a blast, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and, uh, you know, but this is also the woman who like told me like devastating lies. You know? So, so. But I had made peace with that. Like, oh, I get it. She had a mental illness. She never wanted to hurt me. If she could have had control over her mind, she would have just loved me so well. It's not her fault. So that was like mom at home. But the professional mom that I had grown up dealing with, like all these people who knew that hero were like, it's so great to be her daughter, isn't it? And I would just look at them like, you know, I'm eight years old, like, not really, you know, like, (laughs) you know, but I'm just like, yeah, smiling. Yeah, she was great. She's great. I had to do that exact same thing at the funeral. Like, oh, your mother was so important. And I'm like, ah, I'm just, I felt like I was eight or 12 years old again. Like, I was just like, oh my God. And I was so angry with myself because I wanted to be like the the poise. That was my theme word for going back, poise. You know, I'm the wayward child. I'm the youngest. I'm the artist. And I was just going to go back and show everybody that I was standing up on my own and nothing could rattle me. And here I was just like, just thinking like the worst thoughts in my mind. I hate you. I hate her. I hate this. This all sucks. I just want to put my mother in the ground. Leave me alone. My second grade teacher who had told the whole class basically that I was ugly showed up and was like, hi. I was like, what are you doing here? So, You're like, we have some, We have some unfinished business. Oh my God. I really wanted to tell her mean things, but instead I was really sweet and I thanked her for playing guitar with the whole class and I was just angry because I did what everybody else needed. And so often, I I think that's an experience that's pretty common for a lot of people when they're going into this grief, which is intensely yeah. personal, and yet also family and also communal. And people oftentimes will end up in that place of, I'm doing this for other people. This is not, if I could choose how this day was going to go, if I could choose how I was going to honor this person who died, it would not look like this. Right. And thankfully... At some point, the divine universal forces and my emotions took over and poise fell apart completely. And I cried like a baby when I went to give my my portion of the talk at the funeral. And that was really tough. But it was like I was forced to be me. It was good. So the crying felt more like your real self showing up. Yeah. It wasn't the self I had planned on, but it was which would have been for everyone else, particularly my father, who's not a fan of emotions. Yeah, I felt like I had no choice. I wept. Snotty, running, tears, tissue, the whole nine disgusting yards, you know, but it was great. And as you were having this like big cry, big snot fest, you were reading, you were reading a poem that was really special. It sounded like between you and your mom and uh, your mom's aunt, part of a book of poems that the aunt had passed on to your mom, your mom had passed on to you. And in that poem, the last line says, just start to sing as you tackle the thing. And, you know, we started off talking about how your debut album was finalizing just as your mother died. How, how, what's the relationship between your mom and your, your singing career? That's a complicated question because in many ways, you know, doing my music work now is like taking that freedom and being like, yeah, I'm going to be who I want to be. And so, and my mother, as I said, was such an overshadowing force in my life that to have her die the day my album files were finished, it's like, you know what, can you just give me a moment? Like, can I just have some space to myself? (laughs) You know, and I was joking with a friend and she was like, oh, we didn't know when the funeral was going to be. So it was looking like it was going to be sometime in February. And she's like, hopefully it won't be on your birthday. I'm like, it's my mother. It's going to be on my birthday. <laughs> and and was it on it your was birthday? It was not. It was not, thankfully. <laughs> so uh, that was shocking. But um, 
Yeah, she had a, a habit of kind of always trying to upstage big moments. So I was not at all surprised that she showed up in force at some point during this album process. So it's really mixed. Like my mother's the one who taught me how to play piano. But at the same time, you know, I took my first guitar lesson when I was very young. And my mother, who always got jealous of all the other people in my life, I think pulled me out of there after one lesson because of she was jealous of my music teacher, who I adored. And then at the same time, you know, she, when she had Alzheimer's, I decided I wanted to get vocal lessons and she bought them for me as a gift certificate. And she said, you have such a beautiful voice. Now, Alzheimer's allowed her to say that. She had never said that to me ever, you know, in my whole life. And this was, I was quite into my adult years. This was just a few years ago. It's really mixed. You know, do I want mom to be a part of all of this forever and ever? Not really. But then at the same time, she is. <laughs> that's the way it went down. And then that's, that's a lot of what I'm trying to do in this part of accepting these two big things. Like, that's just how it's going down. <laughs> yeah, that there's no fighting against the fact that these two things are happening simultaneously. Yeah, yeah, it's just the big and, you know, okay, those things are happening at the same freaking time. What has it been like to to work towards promoting your album in the midst of carrying this grief with you? Um, it's been hard. Anytime I give all my time to one or the other, I either feel resentful or guilty in some way, right? So if I'm promoting the record, I feel a little guilty that I'm not sad and in grief. And if I'm in grief, I'm resenting the fact that I'm in grief because I need to be working on the record. And then grief, you know, I, I have no control over it. So I just, it shows up when it shows up and I just have to be with it. And it, I, I find it really paralyzing when it shows up. And I tend to get in kind of a funk and there's no way I can dig into this part of me that has to be ultra self-confident to tell people, you've got to listen to my record. It's the best thing you've ever heard. And I'm amazing. And like, you know, to try to promote it. And it's frustrating because I'm an independent artist. And so if I don't do that, no one's doing it. So it's it's definitely been a challenge. Um, and then there's also like the question of, do I include this moment, this death in the release materials. Do I talk about that? Is that exploiting mm -hmm. it or is it just saying what happens? And in, in a world right now where everybody seems to have some crazy extreme story just to get an interview, do I say, well, this is my story? Do I tell it? Do I quote unquote use it? I, it's, it's confusing. Yeah, so much of it's like it is your story and then is it, what is it like to bring that into the work and how will other people maybe judge that? Right. People will judge it differently. Like, so if, if my story was, I was so broke and I had to sleep in my car at, you know, it's like, and then I had a hit record. Oh my God, that's amazing. You're so courageous. But if you're like, my mother died, people will be like, oh, you should honor her. How could you even bring that up? Right. So it's like, this kind of like, hey, but that's what happened, you know? So it's odd. It's, it's a tricky universe. Well, and it's interesting because the the story of the broke artist sleeping in their car and then they make it big, like yeah. it it's so familiar in a way. Right. But that's what gets you noticed. I subscribe to this one podcast and I swear every time there's like a new musician on that they're interviewing, that is how the bio starts. Like so and so had to sell all their possessions. <laughs> so and so was near a bomb that exploded. I mean it's like I find that tricky because it's an extremely competitive world. So you've got to use what you've got. And then at this, then there's also this other dialogue of like, well, is this all part of the gift mom gave me? You know, saying, here, this is the world you're competing in. Here, I'll give you this. I'm going to die right when your album files are finished, like four hours earlier. Or is this like, hey, mom, you don't get to do this, so I'm going to use it. Like, it's just all these like constant crazy things, you know. That's a lot of layers to parse out in the midst of having to do this really hard work and being intermittently paralyzed by grief. Yeah. And also, I I love to work. Like, I wake up, all I want to do is work. I want to work all day and go to bed thinking about work and wake up in the morning and work again. Like, all I want to do is make, create, practice. Like, that's what I do. So the grief, when the grief says, nope, you don't get to do any of that, that's hard because that's my refuge and it's my, it's what makes me happy. But it's... The grief is it's it, that it's hard it's hard to work. Yeah, if that's your go-to kind of coping mechanism or your go-to way of finding joy and connection in the world, and grief doesn't allow you to do that. Have you found any other things that have 
provided comfort or solace as you have those moments of being paralyzed by grief? Yeah, I think the best thing I've found is just like hang with them, just be in a bad mood. You know, if I if I had a day, I'm right in that process at the moment where like the one month days are popping up. I didn't even notice, but 30 days after she died, that's when the grief hit me. I was back from the funeral. I had a few days to kind of just like get back to my life. But then like right on that day, I was like, whoa, why am I so sad? You know, or just this past Monday was the same date of the funeral. So they're exactly 30 days. And I was just, and I had had a great productive weekend. I was like, man, I killed it this weekend. I did everything I need to do. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to keep going. I woke up that day that was like the month anniversary of the funeral and I was just blue. And so I just said, okay, I'm in a bad mood today. That's how it's going to go. <laughs> and that's working for me, you know, just acknowledging. And I feel very lucky in that I've helped a lot of people. Uh, friends through grief. I've watched incredible courage with friends through grief and huge amounts of denial um, and just been there to be like, look, the one thing I know about grief is you get to do whatever it is that you need to do. And for you, you're finding just stepping into it is the most helpful right now. Yeah. Just saying this is how it goes. One of the things I find that's really interesting <laughs> is that I feel like I say to every single person I see, like my mother died, in fact, the other day, I think this is actually interesting. I was at the copy center, like the local copy center, and I hadn't seen them in a while. And I, I'm there all the time. So I was like, oh, hey, how are you guys doing? Blah, 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 this. And I was like, oh, my God, did I tell you my mother died? I like burst out laughing. And she was like, why are you laughing? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like it's just so absurd. And I just keep saying it over and over to everybody I meet. And that is like helping it sink in. It's helping people know like, and that might be why I'm acting weird or a lot of people reflecting back to me their own parental losses and how that went for them. And then I get this, I feel like I'm part of a giant constellation of people who have lost their parents. And of course, at some point, we all will. So I just find that really potent too. People have talked a lot in the past of how they, you know, here's this grief, this death, it's totally life altering, it wrecks your world. But there's no visible evidence of it when you're just wandering around going to get coffee or going to the coffee store. So if you break your leg, people see that. If you change your hair, people see that. But they don't see grief. And so it makes sense to me that there'd be this, like, I have to tell you about this thing you can't see that's so vital to who I am in this moment. Totally. It reminds me of a friend of mine I had when I was um, younger in college, and she was an administrator at my school. And she would like go to get her prescription at the you know drugstore and be like, hi, can I get my prescription? And I'm a lesbian. Like she just, <laughs> she just everywhere she went, she's like, hi, I'm a lesbian. And, and she just needed people to know. And I thought that makes a lot of sense, you know, especially back then when it was just not um, that was her way of doing her activism and her way of existing as herself in the world. And for me, yeah, I feel altered. And also, I don't know. It's also, I'm, I, I guess, the kind of like artist, artistic slash artist, social scientist in me um, is fascinated by people's reactions. So I don't do things for a reaction, but I, I think I'm curious as to find out who this person I'm talking to is, you know, people are always saying, so were you close? And I'm like, what does that have to do with anything? You know, or when people, when my mm -hmm. dog died, people are like, oh, but was she old? I'm like, who cares? Like, <laughs> she's dead. Like, that's an important fact that I'm sharing. It's such a common thing people do in order, my sense of it is oftentimes is to get a little distance from their own mm. experience oh, dogs die, but they only die when they're old. And if parents die, if you were close, I'm probably going to give you a little more space for grief. If you weren't close, then I might not have to like attend to you as much. Um, happens all the time with families who have had a Ugh. violent death. Was the person in trouble with right. the law? Or if someone dies of lung cancer, did they smoke? It's like such an immediate, yeah. like, how can I make sure what happened to you isn't going to yeah. happen to me? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, I was noticing, it's so funny that you say that because I was noticing this when when Tom Petty died last fall and he's like he helped me get through my difficult family um his music and i'm so i'm very attached and i had just seen him play and i again i was in my car just weeping i had all of this like massive tears before my mother died in an interesting pre-grief grief 
And I would say to people, oh, man, Tom Petty died. And they'd be like, yeah, but wasn't, didn't he used to use a lot of drugs? I was like, like a million years ago? Like, why? Why does it matter? You know, it's like, they, especially with rock and roll stars, they just blame their lifestyle as if, like, they they deserved it. I don't get it. Yeah, it's almost that, like, instant self-protection categorization piece that happens. Uh, speaking of your artistry, your singing, your songwriting, <laughs> your album that just came out, how can people find it? Where can they listen to your music? So wherever you like to stream, it should be there. And it's on iTunes and Amazon. And then Bestest Place is on my website, licitycollins.com, which is L-I-C-I-T-Y. And also, if you go there, you can subscribe to The Open Diary, which everyone out there should do because it's amazing. Thank you. And also, I wanted to say that um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but there's a song on the record called Sometimes. And it actually is something I wrote about separating from my difficult family. And then I kind of wrote that song for me and for everyone who has conflicted relationships with their family and what it means to preserve yourself in that situation and how much love that you probably have and we all probably have and I have for my family that they may not even know. I don't think my family knows how much I freaking love them. Um, and that's why it's hard to be close to them because I love them so much and I just get too too hurt. So that song's on there. And oddly, in one of those mystical moments, I got in the car right after finding out mom had died. And because I was listening to the files, I had burned a CD and I hadn't noticed like what track it was on when I had gotten out of the car. When I got back in, that song sometimes was playing. One of the beautiful things about music is it can change and meet you where you are at any moment. And that song just kind of cradled me and was like, yeah, it's okay. It's your family. It's There's love there. I just felt the love in that song, you know, even though there's a lot of sadness in it too. So yeah, and what an what an offering to all of us that your album will be knowing the story and the context uh, in which not so much as you wrote it, but as you are experiencing it now. Well, Lissade, I really want to thank you for reaching out to Grief Out Loud to be a guest and for talking with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I think the work you're doing is is such a gift, and I'm so grateful for the podcast because it takes your work to a because I, I get to hear it you know I, I'm not up there with you at the Dougie Center so thanks for bringing me into your world well thank you again and listeners I will link to all of the the sites that Licity mentioned so her website and how to listen to her album now that it's out it's called One Girl Town and thanks for listening to us today if you want to listen to any of our past episodes you can find us at d-o-u-g-y dot o-r-g or in apple Podcasts, stitcher any other podcast platform you might use thanks for listening hope you'll join us again next time <laughs> oh there was one more thing that i um I wanted to mention because it just happened today. And I remember I was saying how mom has kind of this psychic presence. So right before I was sitting down to do this interview with you, I got a message from my dad that he had just mailed me um, the little mini urn of her ashes that I'm going to take to the beach and probably let go free. So she's here with us today. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.